It's great to welcome to the program today Anthony Weiner, former U.S. congressman from New York, talk show host on WABC. He hosts The Middle with Anthony Weiner and also co hosts The Left versus the Right with Anthony Weiner and Curtis Sliwa. Really great having you on. I appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, so many things I want to ask you about. Ju just because we talked about it earlier today, um, uh, George Santos, the disgraced former congressman, did this uh, very strange interview with Piers Morgan where he was asked, why did you lie about everything? And he doesn't know. He has no answer, et cetera. Y you know, your situation was different in a lot of ways, including that you resigned, whereas he was he was kicked out, essentially. As you were following that story, was anything about the way it ultimately went down surprising to you, given the way the Republican Party operates? Or was it basically exactly what you would have expected? Well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, first of all, I have a certain amount of empathy for him. I kind of feel like we're watching in real time a person who's really breaking down. I mean, who knows where I, I don't want to I, I, I know well enough not to try to diagnose from afar, but I don't have nearly the zeal that other people seem to have. And maybe it's because I have a certain amount of uh, of common experience of being in the middle of a maelstrom. The 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 important difference is or maybe the most important difference is, is the conversations that I was having with my leadership and my colleagues the the most important thing to them and to me was that when I was in the middle of the scandal, and first of all, I, let me just make it very clear. I lied. I contributed to it. I'm responsible for the things that I did. There's no way that there's someone else that did this to me or the press didn't do anything wrong by pointing out the things that I had done. But the important difference was when I would speak to Nancy Pelosi and I would speak to Steny Hoyer or my colleagues and my friends, there was this overarching concern about the institution of Congress. And I felt it too. I really, you know, I was never like a deep insider. I was more and more concerned about maybe being mayor one day, but I had worked there since the 1980s. And I had told Nancy Pelosi, I remember, I said, you know, if I resign, we may lose this seat. I represent a, a Democratic district, but one that, despite what people may think about New York City, was on the conservative side. It turned out that that happened, but that consideration never entered into it. Mm. In his case, um, obviously it did. Obviously the Republicans. Now I, I would point out, as close as these votes were, they never lost one by one. They could have gotten rid of him at any point. And I should also say this: I've said this on the radio. I don't think it was appropriate for them to have thrown him out. I think that, you know, the the people of the third district of of uh, of New York made this mistake. If they believe they made a mistake, but they have a chance to correct it. But all that being said, I did look at it with a certain amount of you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Well, you know, there's an interesting difference, I think, between Democrats and Republicans in general when it comes to these sorts of situations. And the one that comes to mind is the Al Franken situation, where in retrospect, I think that there was maybe a too quick decision to say that he should go, given the relative uh, I don't know, mildness of what he did, particularly when he wasn't even in office. And I think it came from Democrats wanting to show we're not like them. Do, how do you see the Franken situation? Well, it's it's hard. I'm viewing it now from afar. I mean, I think the principal difference that we these things show is that Democrats have more fidelity to the processes of government, more fidelity to the integrity of government. I'm not saying that there are not problems on the Democratic side. You're talking perhaps to one of them, but. I do think that there is this sense that that Congress elected office is about something beyond the individual. Now, sometimes that gets us into a place that we don't think maybe pragmatically enough. And who knows? Maybe if I was in a swing district and the Democrats held a five person, maybe maybe we would see it would have been different. It would have been different with me. But I do think that we do get into this place that we are so into the idea of the fidelity of the instes of these institutions that maybe it doesn't it has shown us to be a little bit quick on the trigger but let me let me just just make sure to separate me from this i wasn't i don't think i was mistreated in any way etc i want to talk a little bit about trump a little bit about biden you expressed recently on your program i think a view that is similar to my view which is i would prefer for trump to just lose at the ballot box and also, it seems pretty clear that when you read Section three of the 14th Amendment, 
he's in violation of that. And it's important if we believe in law and order that we don't pick and choose for political reasons when to enforce or apply the Constitution, that that's what it is. Section three is pretty clear, but also it would be better, nicer, more definitive in some way to just have a country that wouldn't vote for this guy and, and for him to lose in November fair and square. Is that more or less your view? And, and if so, how do you square what should be done with regard to him being on the ballot? It, it, it does. It, it does square with with how I think about it. And it they're, they're inconsistent positions. I'm, I'm, I'm the first to admit it. I mean, okay. I read the Colorado decision and it was the first time that I really took this seriously, because, as you know, we have the most political Supreme Court in American history. Yep. Um, I was there for Bush v. Gore, and I thought they would never exceed this. And now they kind of have several times. It is. I, I have no doubt in my mind that they are going to look past whatever textualist precepts that they claim to have, whatever originalist ideology they claim to have, and they'll put him back on the ballot. But when I read that Colorado decision, which was, I mean, I know not all of our, our shared listeners can go read 200 something pages, but it is, it's plain English and it's pretty darn good and it's pretty darn persuasive and they go into the historical stuff. Look, what comes down to the to two basic questions. One, do we believe all of the constitution still is active? I mean, okay, maybe we have the 19th and 21st amendments. You can say those aren't really things anymore. Um, maybe we're not being asked to to, to, to quarter officers anymore of the military. But we certainly believe this. We certainly believe the 14th Amendment is still a thing, although sometimes the court seems to not want to talk about Section 5 and other things. But the other thing we have to ask ourselves, and I've heard some of my listeners, and just for the context for, 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 for your viewers, I, I'm on a very conservative radio station choosing to do something a little bit different, which is try to maybe not persuade, but try to bring information where they wouldn't get it otherwise. But the other question is, do we consider the people who who were working for us during Reconstructionists? Do we consider them founding fathers also? Do the Republicans consider the the, the Reconstructionist senators, the Reconstructionist president? Do we consider that part of our founding story? And if we're just going to say no, that it doesn't count, or we're not really that proud of that part of our history, um, then I think that my Republican brothers and sisters should come out and say it. But to me, I think you and I have very similar positions. I believe this is going to be reversed. I believe he's going to be on the ballot. And then I think the way we really cleanse the Trump era is by doing it at the ballot box for a third time. He lost in 2016 in the popular vote, lost by nine, nine million some odd votes in 2020. And hopefully he'll lose again in 2024. So then the other side of this, of course, is President Joe Biden. Um, if we zoom out really far, when economies look the way today's economy looks, presidents tend to get reelected when they run for reelection. This is like 40,000 foot view. OK, you look at stock market, unemployment, inflation is not perfect, but it's getting down close to three percent. It went up a little bit based on the most recent report. GDP is up, et cetera. Just super big picture in general. If the election in 10 months is the way it is today, history would say you get reelected. Also, we've never had an election like this one where a former president who lost reelection is likely to also be on the ballot. Uh, oldest president in history in Joe Biden. Both sides are saying there's some cognitive misfires happening here. Which view do you take on the impact that a pretty solid economy will have on this reelection? Well, I think the economy and the the analogy, the, the other one I use is crime. There are some things that perceptions take a, the, the stats, the data are trailing indicators. Now, is that what I mean? Yeah, it basically it takes a little while for perceptions to turn. Around. Yes, yes. And I think that that is happening, frankly, might be at a propitious time that it's going to take a good 10 months or so for people to, to get the message. But there is something else that I think is going on. And I think you have a better finger on it than than I do, given the, the way that you communicate with with your viewers and listeners is I think that we we do kind of have a way to get wormholed in conceptions that take on a life of their own. I mean, we've had this famous, now famous conversation about someone tweeting about a $15 Big Mac and didn't really exist, but it became a TikTok m meme for a right. while, you know, how expensive things are. So I think that, that Joe Biden is facing headwinds in the way that information is consumed and processed by voters that 
I never did when I was in political life. It might not have even been true four years ago, let alone 40 years ago or 50, however we make these historical analogies about what works and what doesn't. And I think further, Don, uh, um, uh, Joe Biden is being hindered by another thing. He is not a great communicator in the classic sense. He, right. You know, he's he's given a couple of excellent speeches recently um, in, in in Charleston and, and at, at Valley Forge, where if you read the speech, you're like, wow, this is an amazing speech. And a lot of people listen to it. So all they come away with is that same trite thing about him being old. Yeah. So the combination of information ain't what it used to be, like facts ain't what they used to be. And his his not being as good as Obama at or or Clinton or frankly George W. Bush or anyone at at communicating and selling these things um, has become problematic. And then a third element of it is that we we he and his team and there has to be kind of a a, a through line of what the strategy is. And I think they they should hang in there with Bidenomics. I do think that that needs to be a thing they stick with. But I do think they've also got to come up with better answers on things like immigration in the Middle East and, the, and the things like that. You know, it's interesting you bring, bring up immigration because on a recent show of yours, you responded to Bill O'Reilly about criticisms to your current view about asylum seekers and immigration policy. And I think you were accused of being to the left of Bernie on that issue. But my conception of you is more of like between moderate and Bernie or something along those lines. I mean, when you look at the Democratic Party today, where do you kind of see yourself in this kind of like Hillary Clinton center left, Bernie further left and then even beyond Bernie? Like, where where are you at this point, would you say? Yeah, I mean, first, just to, to I mean, I, I do a show on conservative radio and I'm kind of like, what would be the analogy? I kind of do a rap music show on a classical music station. Like right. I'm doing something very different. Yep. And, and, and as I alluded to earlier, immigration is widely, the problems that we're having are widely misunderstood. And I think widely mischaracterized. And I think the Democrats and the president have done a bad job at the idea of saying that if you don't like the 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 laws around asylum if you don't like the laws around visas you need lawmakers to change laws mm -hmm. if you want more money coming to cities like new york you need lawmakers to pass that kind of thing and this whole idea that the republicans are honest brokers in this i mean we've missed a chance to kind of say and so the 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 fight that i have been having fight is too strong a word but the effort i've been trying to make is that every time someone calls in a, someone who comes here for asylum illegal, they're just factually wrong about the law. And as someone, you know, with the, the moment someone comes here for better or for worse and say, and is on U.S. soil or on their way to U.S. soil and goes to a border officer and says, I request asylum, they at that moment become lawfully in this country. Right. And yet it seems like both sides seem to be stipulating to this idea that these people are undocumented or illegal in some way. But putting that aside, to your question, it's a very hard one for me to answer because um, when I was in Congress representing, you know, as someone who was one of the leading people talking about single payer health care, right. one of the leading people advocating for Obamacare, I was also, I'm, I'm a, a, a hawk on Israel and, and an ardent Zionist, and I am someone who's been pretty tough on crime, saying we should have federal help to for, for cities to hire cops. You know, it's almost a cliche to say that the parties have moved and left me behind. But I do think it's probably correct to say that I am a more centrist kind of Democrat. Now, to the ears of people on on conservative radio, right. you're a they Marxist. Lump, we're all the same. We <laughs> They get lumped into this thing. And I have this conversation with my listeners all the time where I, I try to get them to put a finger on what it is that they're afraid of when they use the word socialist and accuse me of being a socialist or whatnot. But I guess if I had to put myself somewhere on the continuum, it would be on the more moderate side. Now, the big question I always puzzle about is I wonder if I was in politics today, whether I would get a legitimate primary from the left, which would not be a thing I would generally have worried about when I was in Congress. But would that be something that in today's firmament might happen? I don't know. Yeah. So speaking of which, I'm, I mean, do you do you aspire to get back into elected office? And do you think based on everything that's happened, it would even be feasible? The, the latter part is easier to answer. Probably not. I mean, I am 
probably the most gifted national natural politician you've ever had on your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had <laughs> the vague Ramaswamy on, so I there don't you know. go. There, there you go. Um, look, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not. I'm 59 now. I, I, I've kind of moved into this other genre, and I'm, I'm also in a space where I, I am much less inhibited in what I may or may not say. Right. I mean, I say things about my criticisms of the Netanyahu government that maybe I wouldn't say if I was representing a lot of from people in Flatbush like I used to. Mm. But I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't imagine there's a there's a way that I could I could come back, but. I, I don't know. I mean, I am still a person who gets up every day and try to figure out how to be of service. And and I kind of do see if I was given a choice of being on MSNBC, for example, and being the ninth voice kind of saying the same thing. And what I'm doing now being literally the only person on a conservative radio station that somebody right. gets to hear. I kind of think in a weird way in today's in, in today's world, I might be doing actually more now than I could in Congress. Congress is not a great place right now if, if you're someone like me who likes to get stuff done. I agree completely. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, last thing I want to ask you about is the, the Trump trials. You know, the, uh, I get emails from people who say in the polls, nowhere is it being kind of priced in what's going to happen when these trials start and Trump may be in prison before November, which I find extraordinarily unlikely, if not almost completely impossible. Thinking about it super practically, it's mid January. The election is in early November. We kind of have a sense of the schedule of most of these trials. Is there anything that could happen in the trials that would actually hurt Donald Trump's ability to either be the nominee or to be on the ballot in November or to dissuade Republican voters from voting for him. I just don't see the timeline as being favorable to something will happen in these trials that will take Trump out of the running. Well, I don't know if out of, out of the running is the standard we should have. The question is, I mean, first of all, let's look at the universe of people we're talking about. It's yep. increased. It's it's decreased now to basically swing voters in a half dozen states. Right. So that we can we keep hearing all oh, these trials have only helped Donald Trump in the polls. Yes. Among his base, that could be the case right now. All we've seen is people who who buy this idea that that he's being martyred or being targeted. Yep. But I do think that it's not the results of the trial so much as the trials themselves. You know, when the when the Mar-a-Lago documents indictment came out, it was a fairly short document and it told a very concise story and it was written kind of in a way that wasn't a lot of legalese. And I read it to my, I read, I didn't read it in total, but I read it to my listeners and I said, listen, if this guy did these things, should he be held accountable? Not why is he being charged? Not whatever. If he did the things that I just read to you, should he be held accountable? And even his most fervent supporter couldn't bring themselves to say, no, he shouldn't be held accountable or it's fine to be doing those types of things. Right. So what I would say is the process of the trials, people being, look, let's look what it's going to be. There's going to be a witness on, on the stand who is going to say, yes, Donald Trump told me after the FBI reached out for these documents to move them to this place. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a story. And you wonder if, if never mind his core 30 percent or whatever it is, but Mrs. Crapalucci on Avenue P, who's somewhat flexible, is like, like I, I'm not crazy about Trump. I'm not crazy about Biden. But, geez, this is bad. Um, I think it is going to have an impact. And by the way, the same is true about about the the uh, 14th Amendment case, is that I suspect in whatever the Supreme Court says, they are not going to say this man was not an insurrectionist. They mm. will find some process reason to send it back. And it could lead to it, like in in Colorado, there was due process. They had a trial, as you know. Yep. I believe what would could wind up happening is Supreme Court will say, well, that wasn't sufficient or the standard of of of, of um, evidence was not this. It should have been that. All that means is a bunch more trials. And when you have a conversation, even a conversation that the guy you're thinking of of um, of of, nom of of voting for was engaged in activity A, B, C, or D, even if you want to have an argument, it is not a great headline to say, see, I'm not an insurrectionist after all. I don't <laughs> think I don't think that most moderate voters in Wisconsin will find that to be a very persuasive campaign slogan. 
a former Democratic congressman from New York, Anthony Weiner. Really appreciate your time and insights today. Thank you, David.